is also the author of over 10 books. I mean, I started looking at them all. And many articles, of course. One of his most favorites that you all know is The Struggle for Recognition, The Moral Grammar of Social Conflicts, published in 1992, in English, I think, 95, right? Um, there he develops the concept of recognition, which he's, which Honneth is well known for, derived mainly from Hegel. Um, but within, you can tell me if this is right, within a Habermasian framework of communicative ethics and employing some work, or some of Herbert Mead's uh, social psychology and the objective relations theory of Winnicott, of Donald Winnicott. I'll mention just a couple of his books, a few more anyway. He, in 2003, co-authored Redistribution or Recognition, a Political Philosophical Exchange with the feminist philosopher Nancy Fraser. In 2009, his Pathologies of Reason on the Legacy of Critical Theory appeared. And in 2012, the I in We studies in the theory of recognition. And finally, in not your final book, I mean most recently in 2014, uh, perhaps your magnum opus, Freedom's Right. Um, on a personal note, I'll just mention I met Oxel Hunters many, many years ago. Oh, oh gosh, is it? <laughs> Is it, but you weren't really famous yet. As, not as famous as you were now. And I can tell you from personal experience, he hasn't changed at all, which is very rare. <laughs> People who become so well known, uh, usually they end up sort of auf the blasen of or something, you know, blown up frogs. You know. But he's pretty much the same. So we're very happy to have you here. Um, and to the talk. The talk's title today is Three, Not Two Concepts of Liberty, A Proposal to Enlarge Our Moral Self-Understanding. And I hear a few echoes of Isaiah Berlin's essay in the background. We've seen them all. Yeah. Yes. So I'm very grateful uh, to be here. I'm grateful to Carol and to Sybil for having invited me and make this not very long trip possible. <laughs> Took me half an hour. <laughs> um, but um, I think it's for the first time that I'm here. I remember the first time I was in the, uh, actually in the graduate center of, um, of, uh, of CUNY was 20 years ago when Putnam and Stanley Cavella had a discussion, which was a huge evening, a huge event. Um, so uh, I have just remembrances of, uh, and it was at another place, yeah? It was yeah, the old building. Yeah, okay. So now I'm sitting here and I give my talk, um, and um, yeah, I hope we will have an interesting discussion uh, on it afterwards. <clears throat> Even amongst those of us who are not altogether convinced by Isaiah Berlin's famous essay, Two Concepts of Liberty, it has become commonplace to adopt a distinction which largely coincides with the one he offered. On the one hand, we think that the culture of modernity adheres to a negative concept of freedom, which grants to the individual the widest possible sphere of protection from external intervention in the pursuit of purely personal interests. On the other hand, however, we are just as strongly convinced that individual freedom only truly exists when one orientates one's own actions according to reasons that one personally holds to be appropriate and in this sense determines oneself. We sometimes adopt a distinction within this second positive model of freedom between an, autonom an autonomous and an authentic form of self-determination. This distinction serves to contrast individual action oriented according to moral norms and individual action oriented towards the realization of one's own nature and the most individually experienced needs. But such a differentiation nonetheless largely conforms to the more fundamental classification of our freedom into negative and positive variants. In the following, I would like to argue that this bifurcation of the concept of freedom, which has developed under Berlin's influence, is incomplete and in a significant respect 
uh, untrue. The two models foreclose the possibility that the intentions of an agent can only be formed in reciprocal interaction between multiple subjects and thus can be realized without coercion only by acting together. This idea cannot be captured by the now commonplace notion that individual freedom consists in the realization of one's own already existing or reflexively achieved intentions. Rather, the realization of freedom should itself be thought of as a cooperative process. And only in the course of this process does it become clear which intentions should be realized. I want to proceed first by illustrating with some well-known examples how we must understand such a form of cooperatively realized freedom. This first step should demonstrate that we have experience with the third category of freedom in our everyday lives, but that we lack the language to identify such experiences as a form of freedom. In the second part, I want to recall briefly the philosophical tradition in which this idea of social freedom, as I would like to call it, has always had a central place. Thus, I hope to reveal that the aforementioned examples from our everyday life have already, uh, life have already been associated by some political philosophers with a third separate category of freedom. Only in the last part do I want to delve into the systematic question of whether the model of freedom which I have suggested by example in fact designates a third concept, which does not conform to the traditional bifurcated understanding. Here my purpose is not only to describe the respects in which social freedom is distinct from the other two models of freedom, but also to explain why we cannot abandon this thought concept in our self-understanding. So I start with the examples I would like to uh, work on. I begin with an example from our political everyday life in which the exercise of freedom should be easily recognizable. Consider our regular or only occasional participation in processes of democratic will formation when we join political discussions, call for protests, sign petitions, or merely distribute leaflets at demonstrations. What is immediately obvious about such actions is how difficult or even impossible it is to describe them with the traditional category of negative freedom, although we quite obviously perceive such cases as exercises of individual freedom. To be sure, in making political statements of this kind, we make use of a space that is legally protected from government, governmental interference, which allows us to proclaim our beliefs freely and without fear of coercion. But, it's, it's, but it is fairly misleading to think of the author of such opinions only as an isolated I, separated from all others, in the way the negative model of freedom suggests. So too it is, is it misguided to think that the action is already completed with the proclamation, and thus that the expression of an opinion is the final step in the exercise of freedom. The political belief that is expressed in public statements would be in some sense falsely understood if it were ascribed to the private resolution of the will of a solitary acting subject. The determination of the individual will would then be undertaken purely monologically and directed towards a merely private realization of its content. This understanding of political expression fails to capture its true dynamics. When the subject contributes to political discourse, she refers in her expression to a chain of earlier statements which she attempts to correct or improve, such that she can only appropriately be understood as a member of a previously constituted, self-reflexively given and already present we. This means that the exercise of the free action 
cannot be regarded as complete with the mere proclamation of her belief. What the individual proposal aims at and where it finds completion is in the reaction of the addressed we, or of its individual representatives who once again attempt to correct or improve upon the beliefs of other participants with their own. This description suggests that the participants in democratic will formation must be able to understand their respective statements of opinions as intervening with one another in such a way that they cannot avoid assuming a V, which they together sustain through their contributions. Although we obviously have the tendency to interpret participation in democratic will formation as an exercise of individual freedom, such freedom cannot readily be described as an exercise of merely negative freedom. This is because the three distinguishing elements of negative freedom have little plausible application to such cases. The actor cannot be represented as a private subject who formulates the intentions of his actions by himself. Nor is he free in carrying out his action only when other actors do not arbitrarily interfere. And finally, his action is not complete as an exercise of freedom with the expression of his own opinion, but rather only temporarily concludes if the other participants have reacted to it in a rationally comprehensible fashion. The actions of my fellow citizens therefore do not place an obstacle to my own free political act, nor do they merely constitute the condition of its possibility. Rather, their actions are so intrinsically interwoven with mine that it is difficult to speak of an individual act at all. It therefore, it therefore seems that we can only realize this democratic freedom through a collaborative, collaborative process in which we understand our individual expressions of opinion as complementary contributions to a common project of identifying a common will. One reason by this intersubjective or cooperative structure of political freedom so easily falls out of you, may that we, that we usually think of voting as the standard case of democratic participation. Thus, thus it can seem as though freedom consists in the singular and secluded act of forming a private opinion about one's own preferences and of secretly recording it without the influence of arbitrary intervention. This picture of democratic action falsely takes the part for the whole. John Dewey famously railed against this view because he saw that it masked the essential participatory element of democracy. And my obvious focus on voting fails to recognize that the casting of the ballot is preceded by public discussion, including open media coverage and thus the process of racist local influence. Such del deliberative discussions are a constitutive rather than merely an incidental feature of democracy. Taken in isolation, the casting of the ballot itself can perhaps be thought of according to the model of negative liberty. But this act is only a snapshot of a much more comprehensive process which is meant to ensure that through appropriate instruments for the exchange of experience and opinion, individual beliefs are not only aggregated, but are as far as possible bound together in a rational general will. Even when such an agreement concerning the common good cannot be reached because starkly divergent views predominate, the resulting conflict over the better interpretation of the general welfare must be described as a cooperative process. Whoever participates in these consensual or conflictual processes of identifying the public will can no longer imagine the related experiences of freedom and the absence of coercion according to the standard of implementing private interests with the least possible interference. To be able to formulate one's own intentions, one must be able to take up the perspective of others and accept their potential corrective power. 
In this way, democratic reformation can be understood as a cooperative undertaking which serves the search for the common good. So as not to create the misleading impression that only democratic will formation with this description as an exercise of purely negative freedom, I want to give another well-known example from our everyday life, which, despite its many distinguishing features, shares several common elements with political participation. Personal relations of friendship and love may also be interpreted as exercises of freedom on the basis of their known coercive quality and the attendant loosening of the boundaries of the self. But they resist description by the standard of the undisturbed realization of privately determined intentions. Even the first premise of a negative conception of freedom does not plausibly apply to this case. Someone who is maintaining a sincere friendship or romantic relationship will understand his actions within this relationship as free, but generally will form his intentions only in relation to the wishes and needs of his companion. The free action obviously emerges here not from interests or purposes anchored in the will of a solitary actor. But even if the negative concept of freedom were not so strongly associated with the presupposition of an isolated I, it would still not adequately capture the structure of freedom within love or friendship. For not only are the interventions of other persons into one's own sphere of action not felt as limitations, which would conform to the principle that only arbitrary or uncontrolled interferences impair the exercise of negative freedom, but also the wills of the participating persons are so attuned to and am enmeshed with one another, that talk of intervention loses its meaning. The limitation of one's own will with respect to the concrete other frequently rises to such a level that it becomes impossible to distinguish clearly and definitively one's own interests or intentions from those of the other. The aspirations of both persons overlap not only in certain respects, but permanently interpenetrate each other so that their fulfillment can only be understood as a common concern. Where, however, individual interests are melded with those of others, where mine and yours can no longer sufficiently be distinguished, the freedom of a person should not longer be measured according to whether her own intentions can be realized without arbitrary interference. It should already be clear that the examples of democratic will formation and personal relationships have more in common than it would appear at first glance. The point at which the negative model of freedom fails is nearly identical in each case. In both democratic participation and personal relationships, it is unclear what constitutes one's own will in respect to which the unrestricted realization of the free act of the individual could be assessed. In the case of democratic will formation, the subject only understands her political actions correctly if she thinks from the concurrent perspective of a we, the permanent renewal of which she contributes to with her own beliefs. But because of the necessity of remaining open to other perspectives, the aspect of these beliefs, which is truly proper to the individual subject, is only something preliminary and tentative. The beliefs, therefore, cannot accurately be taken as a stable output variable, variable that is used to measure the unhindered realization of freedom. Something similar is true in the case of friendship and romantic relationships, in which the boundary between one's own intention and that of the other fail, fall away to an even greater extent. Because of the shared perspective of a we, the plans and the aims of the other are implicated in the determination of one's own will, such that the aspirations of both participants become intertwined. Both in such personal relationships and in democratic political life, the negative model of freedom is inappropriate 
to describe the kind of freedom individual, individuals practice. In these social contexts, freedom consists in an unforced cooperation which assumes a higher degree of consensus concerning the aims of action than the negative model of freedom is capable of accommodating. One might object to the argument up to this point that these examples, even if they don't, do not represent instances of negative freedom, can nonetheless be understood in terms of positive freedom. Since we draw upon the second category to clarify certain aspects of our normative culture by speaking, for example, of moral autonomy, it would make sense to attempt to understand democratic participation and love and friendship in terms of the other model of freedom Isaiah Berlin put forward. But this attempt too quickly reveals itself to be inappropriate for articulating the kind of freedom we realize in these cases. With concept of positive freedom, we no longer describe an individual action as free insofar as there are no arbitrary external obstacles to its exercise. Rather, the freedom of an action is understood in terms of its realization of higher ends or values, whether this should mean agreement with moral norms, as for Kant, or the actualization of one's own natural needs, as in the Romantic tradition. As long we understand freedom, however, only as an activity performed by an individual subject in which it practices a given capability, such as norm orientation or the articulation of needs, then the free character of the activities described in the examples above has not been adequately disclosed. For their distinctiveness consists in the fact that multiple subjects must act for one another in order for each to experience her activity from her own individual perspective as a common practice of freedom. There is indeed some overlap here with the idea of positive freedom in so far as citizens or lovers or friends, friends must orientate themselves to certain ideas, such as the good of egalitarian popular sovereignty or the good of trusting intimacy, in order to act for one another in the appropriate sense. But it is this for one another which constitutes the entire difference between these forms of freedom and the traditional idea of positive freedom. For in democratic will formation or intimate relationships, the good that is striven for can only be realized when multiple subjects carry out an uncoerced actions, carry out uncoerced actions, which reciprocally complement one another and thus enable free collaboration. To be sure, this suggestion could also mean that the difference between positive freedom and the third form of freedom I've been searching for only consists in the kind of good pursued, rather than in the mode of exercise itself. Whereas in the case of positive freedom, goods and values are searched for which are individuals are searched for which are individuals, sorry, in the sense that they are only realize, realizable on account of individual capabilities, these distinctive cases of freedom could be said to concern the pursuit of goods or values that have a collective character, because their realization is only possible through the united efforts of several subjects. Then we would take democratic will formation or friendship or love as representing collective versions of positive freedom. A possibility that Berlin occasionally touches upon in his fam famous essay, if only in order to discard it because of the inherent danger of its despotic misuse. The reason for his rejection certainly makes it plain that he conceives the collective exercise of positive freedom by precisely the same measure as its individual enactment. 
namely that the members of a homogeneous group must all perform the same action in order to realize in consonance those values and goods, the achievement of which is the goal of freedom. But such a picture does not in any way correspond to the kind of freedom we have discerned in democratic reformation or friendship. <coughs> the participants in these cases do not behave like the members of a group who have been forced into line. To the contrary, they must always renegotiate amongst themselves how they would like to uh, how they would like to apportion the responsibilities resulting from the shared value orientation and thus assign reciprocally complementary contributions to the common project. The we that must be assumed between citizens or lovers or friends is therefore something totally different from the collective subject Isaiah Berlin had in mind with his idea of positive freedom, a collective version of positive freedom. In the collective positive freedom Berlin described, one is committed to an ethical end which guides the action contributions of all individuals uniformly. In the cases we have considered, participants are indeed oriented towards certain values, but must continually renegotiate re the form in which common tasks are to be distributed in light of their ongoing reinterpretation of common aims. Alongside the limitation of his will with respect to those of others, the individual nonetheless retains a right to have a say in how the relevant activities should intervene with and reciprocally complement one another. In democratic participation, it thus becomes clear that the participants in the cooperative production of a common will can always choose whether they want the role of speaker or listener, of demonstrator or spectator. Likewise, in the case of love or friendship, the participants recognize the possibility of motivating one another to take on a new distribution of tasks and obligations. The participants in these examples are involved in the commonly assumed we in a different way than the members of the collective which Berlin imagined as the bearer of a supra-individual process of realizing positive freedom. They retain a right to have a say in how they want their intentions intertwined with one another in the pursuit of a goal <coughs> that is constantly redefined collaboratively, and thus to behold in the freedom of others a condition of their own freedom. We can therefore provisionally conclude that the collective version of the concept of positive freedom is in apposite to capture the form of cooperative freedom which is evidently performed in the social practices of democratic participation or love and friendship. In these cases, my freedom is grounded upon the unforced intermeshing of our activities. On this basis, I can env envisage the other not as a limitation, but rather as a requirement for the realization of my strivings, without thereby giving up the possibility of co-determining the goal to be achieved and the form of this intermeshing. Before I pursue this train of thought further, I first want to examine whether one can find suggestions of such a third social or intersubjective model of freedom in the philosophical tradition. So I come to my second point. The two other chapters are shorter. Mm -hmm. This one the longest <coughs> This thesis that the form of social practices exemplified by democratic reformation and personal relationships constitutes an independent category of freedom has been an undercurrent in political philosophical thinking since Hegel. Hegel himself believed that the two forms of freedom, which Berlin would later label as positive and negative, 
did not reach the highest level of freedom which ought to be available to members of modern society. Instead, he con conceived of a third stage of freedom, which he called objective freedom, the meaning of which remains contested by scholars. The basic thought, thought he proceeded from is weaved into the terminology of his philosophical thinking, but cannot be rendered independent of this framework in a much, but can be rendered independent of this framework in a much simpler form. If a person's individual action is conceived of as free only in the negative sense, that there can be no impediments to the exercise of the will in the external world, such a conception fails to consider that the intentions <coughs> underlying the action can only truly be freely formed when they too are independent from causal force and thus anchored in self-positive reasons. Kant, following Rousseau, had similarly concluded that the will can be, only, can be free only when its content is determined by rational considerations. Hegel argues that this Kantian view, to which he affirms, which he affirms in the first step, however, leads to the equally peculiar consequence that there is no guarantee that the self-determined intentions can actually be realized within the objective world. From the defects of these two concepts of freedom, Hegel developed this synthetic view, according to which the complete idea of inner freedom would only be achieved if the self-positive resolutions of the will can be thought of as furthered or willed in or even by reality. For Hegel, this was possible in those ethical spheres of modern society in which the freely chosen intentions of particip participants intertwine with one another, complement one another, and thus find weird fulfillment within social reality. It is not yet altogether clear from this rather formal, broad, rushed presentation what Hegel meant to convey with his idea of a third objective freedom. Here, the different interpretations of Hegel depend upon how strongly Hegel is thought to remain influenced by Kant's conception of freedom. <coughs> According to Robert Brandon, Hegel only socializes the Kantian idea of positive freedom in that he makes the ability of individuals to bind themselves to norms dependent upon the recognition of a community of others whose recognitive authority is also freely recognized by the individual herself. The resulting reciprocal recognition constitutes the normative horizon in which a subject makes use of his positive freedom to renew the shared cultural potential through her own expressive initiatives. That's a notion from Brennan. This interpretation converges with the idea of social freedom I have hinted at so far, in so far as the core of the Hegelian idea is understood as connecting individual freedom to the assumption of the perspective of the we. But the freedom which is realized through this participation in a community of subjects reciprocally recognizing one another's autonomy is in Brandon's interpretation of Hegel, understood only as an individual exercise, as the expressive act of the individual who lends a new accent to the shared culture. To a certain degree, Brandon's notion of freedom is here an expressivist version of the positive concept of freedom. In contrast, I believe that Hegel understood the freedom made possible by reciprocal recognition as itself a common or cooperative practice. According to Hegel, it is only by complementing each other that the intentions of the individuals can achieve the individually desired conclusion. Thus, freedom in its objective sense 
is not something an individual subject can perform on its own, but rather is something he is only able to achieve in regulated collective action with others. I have similar reservations with regards to the profound interpretation which Frederick Neuhauser has given to the Hegelian idea of objective freedom, the subjective dimension of which he attempts to reconstruct as social freedom in his book, Foundations of Hegel's Social Theory, Actualizing Freedom. According to his interpretation, Hegel sets out in his philosophy of right from the idea that a complete concept of inequality of freedom must comprise all the institutional requirements which allow the members of society to, to articulate their particular identities without coercion in the external form of social roles and thus to accept institutionally established paths of self-realization. Here too, individual freedom is linked with the assumption of the perspective of a we which makes it possible to understand specific freedom-enabling institutions as rooted in common interests. But as for freedom, as for random, Neuhauser understands the practice of socially conditioned freedom as an individual act which every participant should be able to, for, to perform for herself without requiring the reciprocal action of another subject. In a similar vein, Robert Pippin interprets Hegel's concept of freedom as referring primarily to the rational agency of the individual subject, though he acknowledged that such freedom is for Hegel only possible in the context of social institutions that provide individual agents with the appropriate recognitive status. According to my interpretation, however, Hegel is driving at a much stronger intersubjective idea with his conception of freedom. The individual can only realize the freedom which is available through certain institutions when he acts in cooperation with others whose intentions make up an element of his own. Not only is, is it necessary for Hegel that the exercise of individual freedom proceeds, from the taking up of the perspective of the we, which either makes possible the constitution of a community of recognition or a common commitment to freedom guaranteeing institutions. In addition, in addition, such an exercise of freedom must be undertaken with the exception, expectation that the other members of the community will carry out actions which correspond to my intentions or needs. Only this doubled intersubjectivity as both a condition and as an end to be produced from my free action makes it possible to understand why Hegel again and again thought of love as a paradigm for his own idea of freedom. Here, according to the famous formula, one is at home with oneself in the other in the sense that one can understand the actions of the other as requirements for the realization of one's own self-determined intentions. As the famous formulation to be at home with oneself and the other already suggests, Hegel intended far more with his idea of objective freedom than to identify for therapeutic purposes certain possibilities of unforced and thus free collaboration in modern society. Ultimately, he wanted to construe our entire relationship to the world in terms of the recognition of our own positive ends in the other of objective reality, and thus also to underscore idealistically our freedom in relation with the natural environment. For our purposes, however, it suffices to limit ourselves to the accomplishment of freedom in the social world, since this is the context which would be elaborated by later authors who would furnish it with, with new aims. Already in early French socialism, critique of market relations, early socialism's critique of market relationships, which were expanding at that time, there was an idea of freedom which can only be appropriately understood with reference to its roots, uh, 
in Hegel's philosophy of right. Unlike the understanding of freedom in classical liberal law, which is charged with the legitimation of purely private interests in the capitalist market, freedom is understood in the writings of Fourier and Proudhon as a solidary activity of being for one another, which both thought was manifest in the unforced cooperation between craftsmen. Just like Hegel, Proudhon suggests that individual freedom must be thought of not merely in accord, as a barrier, but rather as a help to the freedom of all others. Hegel's concept of freedom appears even more starkly in the early writings of Marx. The young Marx sketches the image of a social community where the members no longer work against each other, but rather for one another. Here we find the guiding idea of socialism, namely that one can speak of members of society having real freedom only when the actions of individuals com individuals complement one another in such a way that the freedom of the one is a precondition for the freedom of every other. As for his French predecessors, the playful interleaving of action in the cooperation of craftsmen serves as Marxian's historical model. According to Marxian's conception, the subjects in such interactions are free in a particular way, because each can learn from the other participants that his contributions to the coordinated plans for action are acknowledged and seen as necessary and welcoming complements to the other's intentions. The idea of reciprocally complementing one another makes it clear how much Marx's cooperative model owes to the Hegelian idea of freedom. The attempt to imagine the social integration of a future society entirely according to the measure of such unforced economic cooperation, namely as a community of subjects working for one another, constitutes, in my view, the core ethical impulse of socialism. Here, the social form of the exercise of freedom which Hegel only saw at work in individual spheres of modern societies, is carried over without differentiation into the entire society, in which the members are thought of as cooperative partners who reciprocally strive to satisfy the needs of one another. I do not want to go further into the difficulties that attended this original vision of socialism, as it ignored completely the requirements of the functional differentiation of modern society. For my purposes, it is necessary only to recall an undercurrent of political philosophical thought in which the idea of a distinctively social freedom was already thought of as valid in the 19th century. In the following century, a similar thought was taken up by Hannah Arendt, who understood democratic action to express the original intersubjectivity of human freedom. Whereas for Marx, labor itself was seen as a potential context for social freedom, for Arendt only in the political sphere, understood as a realm of public contestation over the common good, are we free? Because there the individual sheds his private concerns and must widely see this egocentric perspective in collaborative activity. While it is certainly not the case that Aaron's concept of social freedom was inspired by Hegel. His influence is clearly, clearly apparent in the last of the representatives of the philosophical tradition of freedom I will mention. John Dewey, clearly under the influence of Hegel, argued throughout his life that individual freedom is falsely understood if it is exclusively understood as a capacity of possession of a solitary actor. Rather, the degree of our freedom increases when we participate in socially cooperative activity because we are better able to realize our intentions and wishes the more various the interactions in which we reckon with the responses and contributions of others. For Dewey, as for Hegel, the true form for the exercise of individual freedom is represented in contributions to the distributed labor of realizing a common aim, because in such projects, 
the realization of my will is also intended by others. I just want to conclude my short reminiscence of the largely forgotten tradition of social freedom with a citation from Dewey in which the underlying idea of social freedom is beautifully expressed. And I quote from the public and his problems, liberty according to Dewey, and now I quote, is that secure release and fulfillment of personal potentialities which takes place only in rich, in rich and manifold association with others. The power to be an individualized self making a distinctive contribution and enjoying in its own way the fruits of association. End of quote. Last point now, coming to the conclusion and trying to defend the idea that that is a distinctive notion of freedom. <coughs> Adherents of Berlin's conception, of, uh, conception would surely object to this plea for a third social conception of freedom, that it has the fatal propensity to confuse the value of freedom with other ideas <coughs> shared by humanity. Just as little as we should surreptitiously smuggle the goal of social justice into the concept of individual freedom, we may not underhandedly furnish it with the aim of coexistence in solidarity. For both efforts would ignore the irreduc irreducible pluralism of our values and deny the possible conflicts between them. In this last part of my lecture, I want to forestall this objection by once more working out the aspect of freedom in the aforementioned patterns of interaction in order to prove, first, that these do in fact concern a separate kind of freedom. Next, I want to show that the exercise of this freedom in or through cooperative actions need, to be, need not to be bound to the common pure pursuit of the same aim, but rather is compatible with the achievement of completely divergent values. For this reason, the constant factor in such practices is the particular form of social freedom, whereas the values that are pursued thereby can vary and thus ought not to be confused with the underlying shape of freedom itself. If you look back again at previously presented examples of social freedom, democratic will formation, love and friendship, and finally, for socialists, economic cooperation. The first remarkable element is that the participating subject must understand themselves as members of a we, without, however, losing their individual independence. To be sure, the successful performance of actions is bound up with the, with the assumption of complementary actions on the part of others, so that the participants reciprocally take <coughs> up of the perspective of the we. But this in no way suggests that they together constitute a collective which acts like a univocal, merely enlarged eye. With Philip Pettit, we can enable the social ontological position in which this intersubjective exercise of freedom can best be grasped as holistic individualism. This concept assumes that the realization of certain human capacities requires social grouping and thus entities that can only be described holistically. But this does not in any way preclude, preclude the existence of independent individuals. Why, nonetheless, should individual actions that presuppose a community of cooperative subjects be understood as a particular class of freedom? What is so distinctive about such unforced intervening of actions that makes it justifiable to introduce a new category of freedom alongside the, the existing models of negative and positive freedom? Here, in my view, Hegel and Dewey point in the direction of an answer because they each point to different aspects of the same phenomenon. Both are of the opinion that the distinctiveness of the reciprocal process of unforced intervening of ends lies in the fact that the contribution of each is 
is experienced as will by the other. In contrast to all other actions, which can be understood as either negatively or positively free, this class of cooperative actions shows that we can each assume the consent of the other and thus can carry out our own action with a consciousness of unforced responsiveness. Not only is there no expectation of arbitrary interference from partners to the interaction, more than this, one can trust that what one freely does will also be freely wished by the other or all other participants. In more systematic terms, the uncoerced nature of a community action here is increased because both sides know of each other not only that they perform a freely chosen action, but also that the carrying out of this action fulfills an autonomously generated intention of the other. Hegel emphasizes above all the cognitive size, side of this exercise of social freedom as it should exist in the reflexive structure of commonly shared knowledge. Dewey much more starkly stresses the effective side in the enjoyment of experiencing how one's own actions are seen by others as pre preparing the way for completing their own ongoing actions. The exercise of such a form of freedom certainly requires, as already indicated, by the accompanying consciousness of a we, that the participants pursue common aims or values, because these common aims and values require them informing their own intentions to take the intentions of the others into consideration. Each participant limits herself to carrying out such actions which she knows will contribute to furthering their shared aims. Whereas positive freedom is related to the assumption of a reflexive act of self-determination or self-articulation, social freedom is bound to the assumption of the development of a common will. Where such a common will is not present and the perspective of a we cannot be taken up by the subject, it is not possible to form in their consciousness an agreed upon scheme of cooperation which would allow them to act for one another through their complementary contributions. To this extent, the idea of social freedom, unlike the concept of freedom, of negative freedom, but like the positive concept, is a selective category of human freedom. It does not designate a general, unconditional capacity of subject, subjects, but rather one which is bound to the existence of certain social conditions, namely belonging to a community of ethically concordant members. This assumption of membership in an ethical community cannot, however, be misunderstood to mean that the participants have completely lost their capacity for personal initiative and independence. Why this cannot be so can now be more precisely formulated because we have learned that in the case of social freedom, one's own contribute, contributory actions must fulfill the autonomously generated wishes or intentions of one's fellow participants. This assumption can remain valid only so long as I concede to the other the opportunity to, to place the negotiated scheme of cooperative action into question when her individual needs, interests, or positions have changed. Because such a claim must be reciprocally acknowledged so that all participants can understand their contributions as fulfilling the autonomous wishes of others, <coughs> the exercise of social freedom must be bound to the assumption of the recognition of the claim of every other to co-determine the commonly practiced scheme of cooperation. Though social freedom can be exercised only in the pursuit of common aims, the determinate content of these aims always remains open for revision and contestation by the, by the members of the presupposed we. This right to have a say, or better, this recognized claim is not really right, cannot itself be understood according to the standard negative or positive freedom, as though another form of innovative freedom 
protruded from outside into the exercise of social freedom. What the participants invoke when they place the previously agreed upon scheme of cooperation into question is the result neither of a purely private consideration of interest nor of purely individual self-determination as Kant had it in mind. Rather, they discover the content of their will against the normative background of jointly entered responsibilities in order to check whether their wills remain in agreement with the negotiated scheme of cooperation. The difference here is that the participants in this process of discovery do not proceed from an ethical null point, as suggested by the models of, of negative or positive liberty, but rather from the acceptance of responsibilities they already have with regards to others in the pursuit of common aims. That they will bring to the table only those suggestions for adapting the scheme of cooperation which appear necessary in light of their changed needs or interests, to the extent that these are compatible with protect collectively settled goals. The claim to have a say in determining the distribution of burdens and responsibilities in romantic relationships, friendships, or democratic communities is not externally imposed, but is rather an, an, an intrinsic element of the social freedom that the participants together enjoy in such relationships. These considerations lead to the last point of my lecture in which I want to come back to the question of whether the suggestion of a third social model of freedom commits the mistake of confusing the value of freedom with the value of solidarity. Such a reproach immediately suggests itself because the participants can allow their intentions seamlessly to intervene with one another only insofar as they together strive for the common goal of solidarity grounded in trust, whether this takes the form of sexual intimacy in love, the reciprocal support of friendship, or the egalitarian elaboration of a common will in a democratic community. The reason why this works for all contributors so the objection runs, is the unified realization of the good of solidarity and not, as I was, would like to have it, the value of a particular kind of freedom. However, this objection requires more information of what the value of solidarity, solidarity cohesion should truly consist in. And thus one confronts the true difficulty, namely, that although one can identify such positive experiences as reciprocal trust or mutual aid, this does not serve to explain the special quality such solidarity has for us. What difference would it make if the various forms of solidary relationships drew their value for participants from the fact that they constituted different variants of social freedom. Then that which makes love, friendship and democratic collaboration worth striving for could not simply be explained by reference to the good of solidarity. Rather, solidarity would draw its value for us from the fact that it allows us to exercise in different ways a form of freedom in which others are not experienced as in the normal case as limitations, but rather as conditions of the possibility of forming and realizing our own intentions. We, we strive for solidar solidary relationships, not for their own sake, but rather for the particular kind of freedom which they embody in various forms. What attracts us to solidary experiences and what makes these kinds of relationships worth striving for is an experience which is precluded in other forms of social life, namely to see in the reflection of our own intentions and wishes, in the complementary intentions and wishes of our counterparts, that we can only realize them by acting for one another. These considerations allow us to conclude that we are not able to assess the value of solidary relationships without reference 
to the positive experience of social freedom. But beyond this, the idea of social freedom represents the overarching evaluative concept for the special cases of solidary relationships. For what makes the experience of solidarity valuable for us can be explained only with reference to finding oneself again in others, which is what is meant by the idea of social freedom. Social freedom is related to solidarity as type to talk. The various forms of solidarity are empirical manifestations of that which makes acting for one another into a human good. Then, however, the objection no longer obtains that the idea of social freedom falsely confuses the value of freedom with that of solidarity. Precisely the opposite is the case. We are totally in, unable to comprehend the value of certain social forms of being together unless, alongside the concepts of negative and positive freedom, we have at our disposal the third concept of freedom, which makes it clear to us that we strive for such forms of being together for the sake of experiencing the complete absence of coercion. The distinctiveness of this third form of freedom is a complete withering away of all hindrances which the intentions of other subjects generally pose for me. Only here do I find in the social world a sort of home which Hegel already knew could exist only where I am at home with myself in others. Let me conclude therefore by noting that under the historical conditions of the increasing juridification and of economization of our culture, and thus of the rise of a purely negatively understood freedom, it is high time to recover the period tradition of the idea of social freedom. Thank you.